Welcome guys, we're back, Crazy for Crew. So today we have a script supervisor. Her name is Anna Maria Quintana, and she has been in the industry for years. She has done mostly all the huge films that you've seen, and we're so glad to have her here. She's like the veteran of script supervisors. Even all the script supervisors respect her and her work. So we love to, we're glad she's here. We're glad, we're so fortunate to have her, for her to be a part of this show. We welcome her, Anna Maria Quintana, and we call her AMQ. Here she is. So hi, Anna, it's nice for you to join us. I'm so glad you could be here. It's a pleasure. It's a Thank pleasure you so to have much. you. I was born and raised in Chile. In Chile? Mm -hmm. Wow. I came to this country when I was 12 years old. I, that's all I've ever done. I've never been anything else but a script supervisor. I mean, I had, uh, from the time I was 14, I started to work, uh, but I worked in a library. I were, then I, when I came to Los Angeles, I worked as a um, file clerk. I worked as an usher at the music center. I worked as a sales clerk, and then I was a waitress for a long time. Uh, I worked in various places, and, but my dream was always to work on films. And then, then I started to just work on films and work on films. And then I was always a script supervisor on any film that I ever worked on. I never did anything else. So how did you become a script supervisor? Ooh, so, um, I, I went to Los Angeles City College because a friend of mine loved film. And he said, you should go to school because they watch films. And I said, that's all I ever do is watch old films. And so we went to, this, uh, to Los Angeles City College and I signed up for a cinema class, an art class, and a literary class, because I didn't know, nobody explained to me what you're supposed to do. In those days, you didn't have the internet like you do now and a counselor and all of that. So I had no one to tell me what to do. So I just took those things. And I love the cinema class, because you just watch films and you talked about films. And then you were supposed to do a, a small student film, but I never paid any attention. And I just realized, they said, there's this job called script supervising. And I said, well, what is that? And they said, well, you write notes. And I said, at the time, which is not the right thing. I said, oh, that's like a secretary. Script supervisors would not like that if you were to say that today, uh, because we're more, we're more than that. But um, I said, I can do that, you know? And I just started and they said, well, you take notes. And I just started to take notes. But the thing is, I used to take notes of everything. Like if somebody walked or somebody moved, if somebody in the back did something, I had no idea what that was. I had no perception that there was someone behind the camera. Because when I watched films as a little girl from Chile all the way to growing up, I always thought that was it. You know, I didn't know that there was this whole world behind everything. So then that's how I started to learn. And so I did one student film uh, and I have always been at the right time at the right place. I don't know what it is with my luck, thank God. Um, and that is the first film I did was all students, except a gentleman came who was an editor and he'd been an editor in Cleopatra. So we went to shoot this little student film and he was trying to mentor us. And he would say to me, he says, oh no, no, don't write that, write this. You need to write this. And I said, okay. Then I did another small film and the DP and the grip were the first African-Americans to ever be allowed in the union. So they'd wow. been around for a while. We did this film in Tuskegee, Alabama, and they, they would show me things, you know, they would, you know, cause they had a lot of experience. So I had no idea what I was doing. So they would show me one or two different things and I adapt that. Then I did another small little film. And again, someone with a lot of experience came and would show me things. And then, um, a friend of mine used to say, just call and say you want to be a script supervisor. And I'd say, okay. So I used to take the variety on Fridays and look at all the films. And I used to call all the films and I used to say, hello, my name is Ana Maria Quintana and I want to be a script supervisor. And of course, everybody would hang up on me. Everyone would always go, you could actually hear the click. And then one day someone said, do you speak Spanish? And I said, yes, I do. They said, can you hold on? And I went, 
And they came back and they said, can you come for an interview tomorrow? And I said, absolutely. And I went for the interview and it was for a film that was going to be shot in Mexico. The director was English. The whole crew was going to be Mexican. And they kept saying to me, we feel that the script supervisor, who's the most important person on the set, and I used to say, what are they talking about? What on earth are they talking about? And they said, but we need them to speak Spanish so they can help the director. And they never asked me what I had done. I had never done a professional film and they hired me. I hate to say this, I was very young. Uh, I only wore mini skirts and high heel shoes <laughs> and they saw me and they hired me. And they just thought I knew what I was doing. I did, I mean, I did, but I didn't, you know? And I went off to Mexico and it was the greatest experience of my life and the best of my life because of course the whole crew, they were all in their 60s, they had done a million films worked with Pepkin Pa, worked with John Huston, worked with um, John Ford, uh, with Buñuel. So their experience was huge. I was the only woman on set, young woman at the time. They all, being the Latin, they all fell in love. I fell in love with them and they all helped me. They all helped and they guided me. The DP guided me. He knew right away I had no idea what I was doing. And of course, typical DP would always say, come behind the camera and look through the lens. And of course I used to, but it was because they were all flirting. They were, <laughs> yeah. but in those days, I know that it's the wrong thing today and I understand it, but in those days it was a different world. And that's how I went. And I went from one film to another. And from there, I did big films right away. The first five, films, I worked with huge directors and I just went from one film to another. Right. And I taught myself, I adapted every, in every film, someone showed me something you know, who had experience, like the AD on that film had been a script supervisor for a long time in Mexico and had done over 40, 50 films. So he would say, don't do that on the notes, don't do this. So that's how I adapted. So I, to this day, I still, if I see something from another script supervisor, I add it or I adapt it. There was Eight nothing, that, there was no classes, not like today where you have all this information on the internet. You can actually just pick everything up and you'll see it all. Right. Didn't have any of that. I tried to speak to a couple of, um, uh, you know, seasoned script supervisors. They weren't very open to it. It was a very closed, tight knit world in those days. They didn't want you in. Nobody, you know, you'd call and you say, can I get in the union? No, that was it. Um, and it just, just, you know, nobody would let you in. Nobody would explain anything. And the only way that I got into the union was they, uh, due to a DP who they took the union to court because they had been so closed for so long. Mm -hmm. So they had something to do legally that you're not allowed to do that. So they opened it, but you had to have done one film in Los Angeles for 30 days. And I had done an independent film mm -hmm. with someone and I got in I'd like two days to go before the thing was closing and I got in. But I never did the 30 days with that in mind. Do you know what I mean? Right. Not like everyone does that today. I just didn't even know. It just, they said to me, have you done one? And I said, oh yeah, I did this one film. I said, well, you're in. And I said, okay, and I, I got in. Just, I'm just very grateful to this day, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I still can't believe when I go into a set, when I've done like these big, I always go, what am I doing here? How, can, how did I get here? Yeah. I'm still at awe by it all. And I hope to continue it. That's why I haven't left it. And that's why I still work because I still love it. Right. And I'm still, grateful that I can't believe that I can do it. And that I actually understand, of course, now with all these years, I understand the editing. I understand the pacing. I understand actors. I understand the writing. I mean, I've learned, I've gone to school for 45 years, you know? Well, you get the script and the first thing, obviously you got to read it. And then usually they always want a timing of the script. So you time a script because they want to know how long it's running. Is it running too long, too short? You know, the producers want to know that. And that helps you when you read it to really get to know the project, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll read it about three to five times. And then you do a breakdown of your script, which means you you, you do like a one line synopsis of every scene and you type it out. I used to always, I've always typed everything. Um, now of course you use the computer and you do a breakdown and you decide, or you, by reading the story, whether the story takes place in a day, in a month, in years, you know, some stories take place in years, they have flashbacks and all of that. And you have to break it all down so that you know when the day ends, when the day begins and when the day ends. And it's the most important part at the beginning 
because with that breakdown, props, wardrobe, makeup, hair, and set dressing, all the departments work off of that. You all work together so that you're all in sync as far as this story takes place in 12 days or it takes place in five years in a person's lifetime. Because they'll come to you and they'll say, was this before? Was What year is this? You have to know what year, you have to know what time in the script. You know, what time of the day it is in the script. Because a DP might come and say to you, is this early morning or late evening? Because you know, he's lighting even though you're inside, but he might want to give it a look of an early morning or a late evening. So you do all that. After you do all that, um, you prepare all your production reports as far as how long is the script, how long is each scene. Uh, you prepare all your paperwork. And, and then uh, I'm trying to think, I've always said this, that what is really amazing about a script supervisor's job is that we're usually only hired about two to three weeks before a project starts. Mm -hmm. But by the time the project starts, people have been on it, you know, like the DP might have been on it for a year, uh, uh, the set designer, a wardrobe stylist, you know, might be on it for a long time. You come in two to three weeks before, and when you come in, you have to know the script better than the writer, better than everyone. You have to know that script inside out because they, every department, starting from director, producer, DP, wardrobe, and everyone down will come and ask you a question and you have to know it. You have to know that script inside out. So by the time you start shooting, that has to be embedded in you, you know, to know all of it, you know, what happens in every part of the script. So that's how you start. Right. And then of course, there's all the work that you do. Once you do start production, you have to do the reports every day. You have to write all the notes. You have to be aware of what the camera's done uh, and, and remember everything. You know, when a director says to you, did I get a close up yesterday when I shot that scene? You have to know it. I actually didn't know that much about television when I started. I mean, they always took me on films. And once I did one time, I said, I want to try it. I want to see what it's like. Mm -hmm. So a friend of mine, she needed a day off. She need, she had an emergency, a family emergency. And I took um, over for her on what was the thing on eight room is enough or something like that. It was, I can't remember the TV show. And I went in and I said, oh my God, this is unbelievable. Because in the TV series, by lunchtime, you've done like 30 setups. In a film, you do 20, 25 in a day, you know? So I was like, and the so speed, the pace. the pace is just so huge and so big. And it's, it's a whole different rhythm. It's a different um, setup. It's a whole different mentality to it. I mean, I've always said my hat off to every script supervisor who's, who does series or television because it is amazing work. I mean, it really takes a lot of it. And you don't have all the tools available. A lot of the series, you don't have the playback from films. Now, of course, I started without that, but now you have you know, all, all the things available to you. So I just got used to it. And then, you know, in the industry, unfortunately, there's a lot of, um, uh, everything gets put in departments. So people who work in films, work in films. People who work on television, work on television. People who work on commercials, work on commercials. And they don't really crisscross because the production people, they don't crisscross, so they don't know you. So they'd rather stay to the people that they know. That's what happens. So it's a little harder. It's not harder to break in from film to television and from television, but it's harder to break. Like for example, if you only do commercials and you want to try to do a big film, they were going to go, oh, I don't know. We're not sure. You still know how to do the job, but they're not sure of you. They don't want to, you know, they don't want to do it. I've been very fortunate because of the fact that I did all these big films. I am able to crisscross between features and commercials. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been able to, I've been able to keep that niche, which is fantastic. But television, I just, I never knew the people. I've never been yeah. asked. I did do one television film years ago because Vilmos Sigmund, the great DP, he was asked to do it because he wanted to do it to show that you can still do good work in television. Because mm -hmm. in the old days, you know, television was always thought of as like, oh, that's like the stepchild. But if you look at the stuff now, it's just fantastic. I mean, the writing, the directing, the, the, the camera work, everything is just great. I mean, great stuff now, you know? Um, so he was one of the first ones to sort of want to show that yes, at that pace, you could still do the fantastic work that you do on a feature. You have to love it. 
You have to really, really love film. To me, that's the number one thing. You have to love it. Um, it has to be all of you. It has to take over you. It's so much more than the 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 equipment and the the gadgets. It's you have to really, really love it. And I I, I think that's the one thing with me. I just to me, the director is God. You know, mm -hmm. to, and, and you just back that person. You have to really believe in the project. You have to really love it and really be there for that person. Not be there to go, oh my God, he doesn't know what he's doing. Oh, that's so, -and -so. no, you can't. I, I, that never crosses in my head. I don't have that. Well, as a script supervisor, you know, what's the beauty of it is that you are at the center, you know, you, you're part of the nucleus, you know, cause you have your director, your DP, your first AD, that's the front row, so to speak. And you're right there and you're there to listen and watch everything that they're doing. And the way you would assist, you can assist a DP, like it just happened to me yesterday. We were getting ready to do a shot and there was a little light in the corner of a desk and I went to the DP and I said, that light was on before, did you, did you want it on? I never go and say, hey, that light is not on. No, I never do that. I always go, did you want it? Because sometimes a DP might want to change his mind. Right. And that's, that's his priority. It's not for me to point it out, it's up to what he wants to do. And he said, oh, thank you for reminding me about that. So you'll help in that. You'll help, like, for example, when you shoot interiors and exteriors, because, you know, sometimes an interior could be in Los Angeles and the exterior could be in Montana, right? Mm -hmm. And But all of a sudden, it's which lights were on and off in the house. Usually, the gaffer will keep track of that, but sometimes it slips. So it's up to you to remember. It's up to you to check. Are all those lights supposed to be on? Should, should I, they be off? No, because remember, there was a fire in that room, so there can't be any lights in that room. You know, things like that. That is your thing to remember. So then, and then your director, you, you want to make sure that everything that's on the script is done. Everything that's, it's your responsibility that everything that's on that script is done. If the director decides not to do something, that's fine. Then you just write on it, it's been omitted. But it's your job to remind them and to make sure everything's done. Even though the assistant directors, that's his job too. But you're like another checkpoint. You're another, that's why you're a supervisor because you're supervising all the different departments. So you have to make sure that everything that's on the script has been done and every shot that's needed for a scene before you walk out of that, that room has been done. If it's forgotten, it will fall on you more than anyone else. A director will turn to you and say, did I get all my shots? Did I, do I have everything to be covered, you know? And you, it's your job to know that. So, and then with the assistant director, you also work with him because when he does a shot list or he gives a schedule, you have to double check it to make sure, but wait a minute, you're missing the bathroom scene. What happened to the bathroom scene? Oh no, because we, we decided they're gonna shoot that when we when we go to Compton or whatever, you know? And so, or they'll say, oh no, what happened to that scene? Oh, we decided to omit it. Well, you have to omit it, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's how you work with all of them. And you listen to everything they're saying so that you absorb it or you write it down. I'm always writing down whatever notes they say. And it's your job to remind them all before anybody moves from the setup. Well, again, you gotta be paying attention and listening. I mean, hopefully the one thing that is still staying is they will have a rehearsal. So at least when you watch a rehearsal, you'll hear the director because he'll be talking to the DP and he'll say, so I, when I do a wide shot, I didn't wanna make sure I have a two shot. So you're absorbing all this and make sure you're writing it all down or if you, unless you can remember all of it um, and you know, but I also now, I know shots and I know what you need. So I'll really listen to what he's saying and then absorb it all. But if I see something that doesn't quite work, I'll say to the director, um, I know you're gonna go from that wide shot to the two shot, but then there seems to be like something will jump. Do you think you need an insert? Do you think you need a close up? And the director will say, no, I really don't want it. That's the way I want it. Perfect. Or he'll say, maybe that's a good idea. We should get that. That's how you help with that kind of thing. You always have to be ahead. Remember, you're representing also the editorial team on set. You know, you're making sure that they'll get everything that they need. Oh, absolutely. You have to know, you have to know film. You have to know what works, what doesn't work. You have to, for example, a pace in a, in a scene. You know, sometimes 
we'll do a rehearsal, right? And the director, you know, the actors are all into it and whatever, and you do a great rehearsal. By the time you get to the fifth person in the scene and you're doing their close up, they're going like, oh, so the other day. And so you go, wait a minute, what happened? The, the whole pace of the scene was a whole different pace. You know, you can't all of a sudden change it because when you put it together, it's gonna be off. You know, it's the, the rhythms are gonna be off. Right. And so you'll say this to a director and he'll say, oh, you're right. Well, you know, when we did the rehearsal, the scene was running two minutes. Now we're doing the coverage and the scenes are running like four and a half minutes, which means something's wrong. We gotta pick up the pace or the other way around, or we did it slower and now they're doing it too fast. That's up and to you. Let, and you'll let the director, you'll let the director know. know. Now it's up to him if he decides he wants to change it. Obviously, remember his word is law, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so you have to, know. also with actors, you know, you have to watch them because they'll change things in their performance, you know? I've, I've done this with directors while well, really, really watch the performance. And I'll say, I just want to let you know that when we did the two shot, she was very, very distraught. And now when we're doing the close up, she's holding back. So. You know, what would you like to do? Oh, we should try one that way, you know, because you don't know how you're gonna, when you edit, you wanna have every option available to you. Right. You don't wanna be restrict yourself to only one. So it is your 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 job to also know about the pacing, the mood of a scene. Directors know, I mean, all good directors know that too, but they have so much going on sometimes that you just have to be another pair of eyes, another pair of ears, you know, listening and watching for them and reminding them of little things because they also get caught up and also actors get caught up and actors get very creative and all of a sudden they decide to do something in a scene, which is great, but you have to make sure, does the director have enough to cover himself with this new phase that, that the actor decided to do? What if the actor now came up with a great idea? Wonderful, fantastic, right? But how does it work with everything else you shot? Does that mean you might need to get an insert or pick up a shot or pick up a two shot or pick up a, an over the shoulder to make that work? Because it's great now, but how do you make it work? Does he have everything? Usually, again, all directors know their stuff and they'll adapt themselves, but it is also your job to help them with that. It's, so, it's such a different world. It is. It is such a different world now because um, everything's shot so much faster and quicker and the, and all the editing is done faster. I mean, it's just, you're not in as much, you know, with directors. Mm -hmm. They don't really let you in. And unfortunately with the new crop of directors coming in, our job is really not explained to them. So they don't know how to use us. Right. They think we're there to bother them. They think we're there to point out errors no we're we're there to help you um so it, it's it's a difficult it's a difficult world now it's a different world now i think it's great that you have all these classes from experienced script supervisors which will let you in and will show you what what happens um because the basic first is all the paperwork obviously you know i can i've always said this i can show someone the the work in two hours how to do the paperwork, but that's not the job. The job is more than just the forms. That's one part. Right. Then you have to learn about scripts. Then you have to learn, you know, feel your director out. I mean, that's what I do when I first start. I just feel, how does he work? How does he like it? How am I going to get in there? Remember, there's this group of big people who don't want anyone in, you know, they don't want anyone to tell them anything or say anything. Uh, so you have to be able to diplomatic. That's the word. You have to be a diplomat. How to get in there, to be able to get your point across, not be annoying. You don't want to uh, you know, bring out points that are not important. You only want to be able to speak up when it's important, when something is very important. So you have to really sort that out before you, you speak. All word of mouth. All word of mouth. All the word. It's, it started from Mexico. From there, they said, oh, she's... I always had a love of film, and I always had a sense of film, so I always knew when something wasn't right. I could walk into a room and go, wait a minute, that wasn't there. Something's not right. Because visually, I, I, I think like a filmmaker, right. so I know when something's not right. Do you know what I mean? So, I mean, with matching, you're always writing down things, because continuity is one of the biggest things for you to remember things, right? But... 
I always know when something doesn't feel right. right. You know, I can walk into a room and not know that. And so from Mexico, they said, oh, you got to hire her because she speaks Spanish and English. And they all thought I knew the whole system here in this country. And of course I didn't. Right. But in those days, very big American films were being shot in Mexico because obviously it was cheaper because, you know, what they paid a crew down there was a third of what they mm. pay a crew in the United States. So I got to do very big films with very big people right away. And it all went by word of mouth, word of mouth, whatever word they'd say mouth. hired her. They liked, they liked the way I worked. I, I, I like to think they did. And I was just incredibly grateful. The way I got um, Mr. Spielberg was um, I had worked with a teamster and he became a producer and he remembered me and he remembered that, you know, what I was like on a set. And when Spielberg was looking for a production, uh, for a script supervisor, he, he brought me in for the interview and Stephen had interviewed all these people. And when I interviewed with him, I interviewed with him in a hallway. I didn't even get to go in the office. And it was like two minutes and Steven said something funny and I laughed and that was it. And I still don't remember what he said. I bet you did 10 movies with him. And I never thought I'd ever get the job and they gave it to me. Wow. And I decided to stick with him, you know? I, I mean, because it's hard. It was hard work. It's yeah. not easy. Amazing um, career. But it was, the, the, I mean, it's a great honor to have been able to work right. on the films that I did with him, right. you know? I think you did great. Oh, Thank great. you so much oh, for you're being welcome. here. You're welcome. Oh, I, hope, I hope it was good. <laughs> I hope I was... Concise. <laughs> Very concise. Okay, great. <laughs>